Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated for the reading of our, of our Lord's Word. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper, he shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter or a sheep before the shears, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their, their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Into thy hands I commend my spirit <clears throat> Father into thy hands I commend my spirit In the Lord have I hoped Let me never be confounded Deliver me in thy justice Into thy hands I commend my spirit Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth Father, into 
to thy hands I commend my spirit Father into thy hands I commend my spirit I am become a reproach among my enemies and very much to my neighbors and a fear to my acquaintance they that saw me that ran from me I am forgotten as one dead from the heart I am become as a vessel destroyed Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit trust in thee O Lord I said thou art my God my lots are in thy hands deliver me out of the hands of my enemies and from them that persecute me Father into thy To the hands I commend my spirit. Make thy face shine upon thy servant. Save me in thy mercy. Do you manfully let your heart be strengthened? All ye that hope in A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, According to John Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden, into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, whom are you looking for? They answered him. Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. 
Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die, rather the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made, because it was cold, and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I've always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather, and in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there, keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning. And they themselves did not enter the praetorium, in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone in order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled that he said indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, king of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid, and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him, so Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you, and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason... The one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. 
Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription, because the place where Jesus was cru crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write to the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it. In order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happens so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, They will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. So just as we uh, have the opportunity to just hear the passion and reflect on the passion of our Lord, um, there's something about this that uh, I think there's some parts of the story that make sense. And I don't mean that in, in, a, in like a bad way, but I think there's some parts that people's actions make sense. Like for Pilate, it makes sense. Uh, he has so much political pressure on himself that 
yeah, even though he knows this is wrong, he's gonna do it anyways, because that's sometimes what happens. Um, the moment where the, the guard strikes Jesus, um, he, thinks he, he thinks he's talking back to the high priest. And so it makes sense that he would do that. Um, even the fact that Jesus was scourged, we talked about this, I think, last Sunday, uh, or two Sundays ago, how, what, what it meant to be scourged. Um, the fact that that even happened, that, all those pieces make sense because that was, that was their orders. They were, they were ordered to do this. The part that doesn't make any sense um, it's here in, again, John's gospel. We just heard it. It says this, it said, um, it said, Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. Okay, we got that. But then it says, and then the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it upon his head and they clothed him in a purple cloak and they came to him and said, hail king of the Jews. The part that doesn't make any sense, the crown of thorns. The crown of thorns doesn't make any sense. Everything else that happened to Jesus, someone was told to do that. But here is something that no one was told. No one was told to put a crown of thorns on Jesus. No one was told to go, hey, go over to that bush and then rip off some of these branches with thorns and weave them into a helmet of thorns and place them on Jesus' head. Everything else is, you could, you could at least make an excuse and say, well, that's what they're ordered to do. This is just cruel. Like this is, to reflect on that. And I think there's something about this where we could hear that and say, well, I'm not like that. In fact, you can see that kind of cruelty and say, well, I'm not like that. And um, the truth of the matter is, yes, you are. There's something about this day, Good Friday, that happens so much in darkness, so much happens in darkness on Good Friday, and it's so important for us to face the darkness that is in, 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 in us. And again, maybe, if, maybe you say, I'm not capable of that. I say, yes, you are. At least you have the potential for this. There's a book that came out not too long ago. It's called Ordinary Men. And it's about those men who became the torturers, essentially, those who became the, those who ran the concentration camps, those who ran, uh, ran the, uh, the death camps of the Nazis. And so sometimes we, ha we have the image of them as just like these people who like were true believers in like the Nazi propaganda. They were, they were raised from, you know, the part of Nazis, uh, Hitler's youth. And so they, they believed it from a young age. But the majority, the vast majority of those who did unspeakable things to other human beings were just normal people, truly just normal people. In fact, there's an account in this book that talks about how a number of these men, women, and children were brought to a place where these 500 just police officers in Poland were told by the supervisors, um, we need you to kill all of the women and children. They're gonna ship the men off to work just kill all these women and children. If you don't want to, you don't have to do it. They didn't even make them do this. They said, if you don't want to do this, you don't have to do this. And many of them didn't want to do it, but out of 500 men, only like eight or 10 people refused to do it. The 490 just did it. Again, they weren't forced to do it. They just chose to do it. In fact, they even did this mental gymnastics. There's one account where one of the men, he kind of teamed up with his neighbor. He said, I don't want to do this at all, but if you kill the women, um, I'll kill the children because at least in my mind, I'll rationalize that I'd, here's a child whose mother's already been killed. I don't want this child to be raised without a mother, to live without a mother. And so it was an act of mercy in their mind. They convinced themselves that this was okay. They didn't have to. They could, literally could have walked away and they didn't. They weren't just following orders. They weren't just doing their job. This was something more. Just like in the gospel today, the men who made a crown of thorns and pressed it into Jesus' head, they weren't just following orders. No one told them to do this. This was something more. This is basically what you call diabolical. So diabolical goes from the, 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 the Latin word diabolos, right? So diabolo in Spanish means devil. It's satanic. It, what it is is this kind of cruelty. Actually, I think it's connected to um, one vice more than anything. I think this this cruelty is connected to envy more than anything. It's not hatred. It doesn't have to be. Because to hate someone, you have to actually care about them. But envy is something different. Envy is something more subtle. Envy is something more sneaky. There's a difference between jealousy and envy. Maybe you know this already, but jealousy is uh, an, inor an inordinate desire for what someone else has. The inordinate desire for what someone else has is, is, is jealousy. I want that. Envy is different. Envy doesn't even necessarily want the thing. Envy just doesn't want you to have it. So if jealousy says, I want what you have, envy is, is again, it's twisted, it's sneaky. It simply says, I don't want you to have it. I remember uh, at one point uh, years ago, I think I was a senior in high school, my house got, my parents' house got broke, broken into and 
some burglars or a burglar, they stole a bunch of stuff. And my dad, at some point, he said, I understand this, I, I get it. Someone is in need um, and they're gonna take stuff, they're gonna rob the house. But there was one room where people just, the people who broke in, they just broke stuff. And I remember him saying, the only thing I'm mad about, because I get it, I get the fact that if, if, you, if you need money, if you need whatever, the, the thing that they're gonna take, I understand that. He said, I don't understand just breaking something. I don't understand just ruining something for someone else, but that's what envy does. Jealousy is, I want that. Envy is just, I don't want you to have that. I just want to take something from you. And again, we experience this on a, on a regular basis. I mean, how many times have we said something like, you know, here's a band, here's a TV show, here's a movie, here's a, here's a person, a celebrity, or whatever it is, and, and so you just say like, I don't really like them. And someone says, well, how come? Why? It's great. Or, well, I don't really like that band. Or, I don't really like that person, that celebrity. Like, how come? What'd they ever do? Like, I don't know. Just everyone likes them. That's envy. I don't like them. Why? Because everyone likes them. I just want to take them down a little. Now, in this moment, on this Good Friday service, you could say, well, why, why, why are you focusing on this today? Like, out of all the brokenness and all of the evil that's on display in the passion of Jesus, why... Why focus on envy? And I would say it's because this, because I think that this moment of Jesus' life, it is so fitting that we talk about envy. Because the Book of Wisdom says, through the envy of the devil, death entered the world. So go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, right? Genesis 1 and 2, God makes this world, makes it good. He makes human beings, makes us good in his image and likeness. And then Genesis chapter 3 happens, and you have this, right, the serpent, the devil, Satan himself, comes into the garden have you ever asked why? Have you ever like, even stopped to ask, so why? Like, devil, why do you even care? Like, here's God's human beings, right? Adam and Eve, here they're in the garden. They're not doing anything to the devil. It doesn't cost the devil anything for them to be loved by God and for them to love God back. So why in the world do you want to break it? Why in the world do you want to break it? Good devil, because the Satan, you already have what you want. In fact, remember Milton, he wrote, written in, in Paradise Lost, the words he put in Satan's mouth are better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. He has what he wants. It's because envy. Envy is not, I don't have what I want. Envy has, sees someone else having something good and says, I don't want you to have it. So if we don't even understand, like, why does, it, why does St. Peter say, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour? Why? Because he just doesn't want you to have the good thing. He doesn't want you to be loved by the Lord. And this is what happened is, is from that moment in Genesis chapter 3, this brokenness that comes into the world because of envy, what's the next sin after the eating of the apple? There's these two brothers, Cain and Abel. And what happens? Here's Cain who offers his sacrifice to the Lord. Here's Abel who offers his sacrifice to the Lord. And it says that God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but Cain's sacrifice he didn't accept. And Cain was upset about this. Why? Not because he wanted what Abel didn't have, but because Abel had something that he didn't have. And even God even says, Cain, you don't have to resent this. You don't have to be mad at your brother. You can let go of this envy. You can resist this, this, step, this trap of envy. But Cain doesn't. And as we know, Cain took Abel's life. And that is what led us here to today. That's what's led us here to this Good Friday service. That's what led us to a crown of thorns. That's what led us to cruelty. That's what led us here is envy. And so why does Jesus here, why does Jesus allow not just himself to be scourged and crucified, not just allow himself to carry a cross, but to allow himself to be crowned with thorns is he came to undo what has been done by original sin. And the source of original sin was what? It was through the envy of the devil that death entered the world. Envy destroys and corrupts hearts. And Jesus is the solution. Jesus bearing a crown of thorns is the solution. Even more, we can do things practically today even just to be able to realize there's three things that we can do specifically that Jesus made it possible. One is joy, the second is zeal, and the third is the gaze. So joy, our response to what, when someone else has excellence, when someone else has success, when someone else wins, to have the freedom, the ability to choose to rejoice in their success. Again, envy mourns someone else's success. Envy mourns someone else's gifts. But to be able to rejoice in someone else's gifts, to rejoice in someone else's success, is to escape the trap of envy. 
Zeal means uh, to be inspired by someone's excellence. I mean, to see someone do something incredible and simply say, I'm inspired by this, that here's a, someone who has, 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 is better than me at whatever field it is. They're better, I mean, I remember meeting someone who at one point, I, I used to you know, do this comparison kind of thing, where like, well, someone's really good at X, but I'm, I'm good at Y, you know? And this, there was a guy I met, he was a seminarian, and it was one of those things where everything, like, I did, he did, but he did it better. Like truly, he just consistently, I'm like, well, well, I'm funnier. Nope, he's funnier. But I'm more this, nope, he's more that. Like it was incredible. Like everything that I thought, like, well, this is kind of part of my identity. He was better in everything. To be able to say, I rejoice in the fact that he has these gifts. And secondly, I'm inspired by the fact that he's developed them so thoroughly that maybe I could shoot for that too. So that's our true responses to the temptation to envy is not to be sad, not to say, I want you not to have that. Not to destroy it or tear it down, but to say, I rejoice in your gift. I rejoice in what God's given you. And secondly, I'm inspired by that. I'm inspired by the excellence that you've, you've reached for. But the third and most powerful and the last one is something that Jesus reveals to us with every moment of his life. Jesus lived, he spent every moment of his life under the Father's gaze. that he, he lived in the eyes of the Father. I think a lot of times when we experience envy, we experience it because we, we perceive that there's a certain lack in ourselves. There is, there is a certain thing we're missing. But to allow ourselves to be seen beneath the gaze of the Father, to allow the Father to declare who you are and what your worth is. That's what gives us the ability to rejoice in someone else's success. That's what gives us the ability to be inspired by someone else's excellence. But to live under the gaze of the Father, that when he speaks, no other voice can overwhelm his. That when the Father defends, there's no liar who can steal or kill or destroy. To live in a place under the Father's gaze where you know that when one is claimed by the Father, there is no room for sorrow at the good of another. The crown of thorns makes no sense until we realize that when Jesus Christ allowed himself, allowed himself to be crowned with thorns, he chose to undo what has ensnared every one of our hearts has led us to be able to be free to choose joy and zeal and the gaze of the Father. Let us stand. Let us say, dear, pray dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty and ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church spread throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord who chose him for the order of bishops may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you, their Maker, they grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop Daniel, for all bishops, for all priests and deacons of the Church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Let us kneel.
the stand. Almighty ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace, all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for our catechumens, our candidates, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for all of our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Let us kneel. Let us stand. <coughs> Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of the redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to, the, to your love in this world, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not, do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so in gladness, confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us kneel. Let us stand. <coughs> Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, the freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, 
granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us adore.
at the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. an act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the works of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. I invite you to bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.